Every two years, the Australian Trucking Association holds a breakfast at Parliament House in Canberra to tell federal politicians about the latest in truck safety research. The guest speaker at the 2014 breakfast was the director of the Monash University Accident Research Centre, Professor Mark Stevenson. Professor Stevenson is a leading injury expert. He has conducted numerous groundbreaking studies, including research on mobile phone use while driving and young driver safety. He recently completed a very large study that looked at the causes of truck crashes. In this presentation, he takes us through the results of the study and their implications for governments and the trucking industry. It's a pleasure to be here um, and certainly to present um, uh, probably I would say one of the world's largest studies of uh, heavy vehicle crashes and uh, studies of these kinds take a long time to do, they cost a considerable amount of money uh, and once we start undertaking research like this we, we also realise that we're just beginning to scratch the surface so uh, what I'm going to present this morning uh, certainly is, is is really just scratching the surface of, of a you know, challenging industry, um, but it's got some real unique elements of what we've found in this study, uh, I think will be of, of tremendous benefit to many of you in this room who are, are, are operating large fleets. Um, so I'll just give a little bit of a background. Um, and Nolene's highlighted uh, elements around road safety and I'll talk just generally about that and, and then move to how we went about uh, undertaking this complex study and then the, the findings and, and just a general discussion around those findings. Um, so this is Australia today and, and this is road trauma uh, across the board in each of our states. Um, we're seeing around um, nearly 1,200 fatalities and uh, 28,000 serious injuries and it's a considerable cost to, to uh, the government and to society. Australia is held up as one of the most successful countries around uh, mitigating um, road trauma. Um, so having said that, we still see that level of burden um, that we are actually uh, carrying. And, and that's a still a very significant challenge for us. Um, nationally, we have a, a road safety strategy and uh, that strategy is aiming for a 30% reduction in fatalities and serious injuries and, and this slide is just highlighting how we're tracking to achieving that sort of uh, goal and it's, it's an incredibly important at the national level to have targets uh, and a 30% target is an admirable target. Uh, and you can clearly see we're, we're sort of on track to, to potentially by 2020 meet that target of, of a 30% reduction in fatalities. The significant concern we have is that our serious injury rates uh, are increasing at about 1.6% per annum. And that is a significant challenge. It's one that government really does need to take uh, note of because serious injury has enormous equilibrium. Uh, what we're talking about there is a life lived with a disability um, and significant challenges uh, uh, in relation to insurance and everything else associated with living with a disability of that kind. So um, we need to do a lot more and when I say we I, t I talk about the general public um, but also in research and science to, to see and operate or identify ways to to really start beginning to tackle serious road trauma, uh, serious road trauma that leads to serious road in, uh, serious injury. Um, and then moving to the heavy vehicle industry, and, and, and many of you would know these sorts of figures, but we're seeing about 181 fatalities on our roads annually, and the good news is that has been declining, uh, about 3.2% per annum. Um, the, the challenge we have also in the heavy vehicle industry is that the serious injury rates are increasing as they are for all road users, um, and we're seeing around approximately 1,500 injuries associated with a heavy vehicle crash. So there is a lot we do need to focus on, um, and, and when, when I say focus on, what I mean in this area is um, not to necessarily just look at the vehicle, and many of you here would be particularly interested here in relation to the vehicle and the drivers and the operators, but when I talk about looking at how we might be able to mitigate and reduce serious injuries in, 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 on our road infrastructure, uh, in our transport 
transport system, I'm talking about looking at it as a system perspective. And that means looking at not only the infrastructure that we are putting out there for, for all road users, uh, but how we operate on that infrastructure, uh, right through from land planning use through to the outcomes around how, in the uh, you know, unfortunate event of a, of a crash, how we manage that and, and provide care after. So heavy vehicle crashes, 18% uh, of fatal crashes in Australia are heavy vehicle crashes. Um, that is an overrepresentation. Uh, about 2% um, of all registered vehicles are heavy vehicles, uh, but we're seeing 18% uh, in the crash statistics. Now, those are sort of absolute numbers. If you were to look at it as a rate, it wouldn't be as, as dramatic as that. Um, as you all well know, heavy vehicles spend most of their time on the road, so exposure is very high. Um, but in the event of a, of a crash, there is a considerable cost associated with that. So we're seeing it about $2 billion per annum as a, as a cost associated with heavy vehicle crashes. Um, and that's a, a broad cost base that we're looking at uh, because, as you'd appreciate, a 12-tonne truck rolling um, on a freeway network has huge implications in terms of cost. We're dealing with, a, a, I think, an incredibly challenging work environment if you compare it to other work environments. Um, and it's, it's one that involves, in, in many instances, longer hours, uh, a, quite a challenging, road envir a challenging environment in that it's you know, a monotonous task in, in most instances, um, it, across a network that's growing um, with other vehicles as well. Um, and uh, one that requires, you know, work in, at night. And working at night is, is, comes with a whole bunch of challenges as well. And I'll talk a little about that in a moment. So it, it, there is no doubt that this is one of the mo more challenging work environments to be operating in. Um, uh, highlighting here that there's a twofold increase in, in road freight. Um, I think there's evidence that sort of talks about with the growth in economy, you'll see a 1.2 times increase in, in road freight um, and our economy is growing, um, it will, will grow and, and on that basis we, we're going to see, as Nolan highlighted, you know, considerably increased uh, activity in relation to road freight. Uh, road freight, and, and you know, coming from Melbourne, for example, I know there's discussions even around uh, sort of B triples on our road networks in order to increase efficiencies from ports through to distribution. So, knowing that, we're 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 going to be seeing a, a, you know considerable growth in this area as well. So, when I started this study, which was in 2008, there was a national um, heavy vehicle safety strategy. And in that strategy, it really was calling for uh, a focus around all of the elements of the heavy vehicle industry. It was looking at wanting to have greater understanding around driver scheduling, uh, the vehicle itself, um, and also the infrastructure that it operates on. And that was a sort of a grand idea that I had is to let's put a, a large proposal together to begin to address that whole driver interaction with the road environment as well as the truck and begin to understand all of that uh, simultaneously rather than uh, a lot of cross-sectional studies which basically go out, interview a driver and report on that. This was following drivers uh, and, and quite a unique design. So the study objectives were these three. Um, looking at employee company uh, related factors such as scheduling and payment. Driver characteristics uh, such as sleepiness, um, sleep disorders and other health matters. Um, and vehicle characteristics, truck, uh, truck configuration and modification uh, and modifications. Now in relation to the vehicle characteristics, at the outset I was particularly interested in wanting to get a much greater understanding of the vehicle itself. Um, and the costs were, became so prohibitive to do that because in each crash we would have had to send out an engineer to investigate the vehicle itself and its systems and do the same for inspections of randomly selected trucks. And that was just going to be prohibitively expensive. So uh, our data that we've collected in this study from vehicle characteristics is, is, really, is all self-report from the driver. Um, and we've chosen to, we chose really objective measures for, uh, for drivers to report on their vehicle. Um, so that's uh, just a caveat at the start. 
So this is um, the design that we, we used. Uh, it's a, what we call a case control study. So you basically take um, a, a number of drivers who have crashed, and, uh, and in this instance, the definition was crashed, and it was a police-reported crash, or police-attended crash, I should say. Uh, and then we randomly selected um, a, a, a population of drivers who hadn't crashed in a 24-month period prior to the recruitment of the driver who had crashed. Um, so it wasn't the, the controls weren't drivers who had never ever crashed, but it was actually hadn't crashed in this in a period of 24 months prior to the study. Um, once we had uh, the police had identified a crash, we went then and interviewed the driver, um, and I'll give you an outline of to some of the other elements of what we actually asked each driver to do. Uh, and we did the same for control. So the ca both the crash driver and the control driver got the same information uh, and completed the same um, surveys and diagnostic tests that we did. Now, the study had, at the outset, we looked to um, undertake the study in Queensland, New South Wales and Western Australia. Um, and due to some of the challenges around pri interpreting privacy acts in, in Queensland, we weren't able to continue the study in Queensland. So the, the results from this study are from crashes that occurred in New South Wales and in Western Australia. Um, the control sites. We had to recruit a randomly selected truck driver. We went to uh, an array of truck stops uh, throughout the states. And this slide here is just showing uh, on your um, left it would be, um, uh, sorry, on your right it would be New South Wales and on your left Western Australia. Um, and uh, it showed in Western Australia we had eight sites. Um, we identified where, what the main trucking routes were in each of those states uh, and we ensured we went and collected data across that network. Um, and we, we randomly selected truck drivers as they presented to the truck stop. So on the same, on the same day of the week as the crash and time of day that the crash occurred um, and throughout, throughout the day. So we were basically um, collecting data from truck drivers uh, that represented Monday through Sunday and varying days, at varying times through the day. We, we stopped interviewing truck drivers at about midnight, so we didn't get a lot of data from midnight to 6 a.m. Having said that, we were asking them about their previous driving in the 24 hours before the interview, so we did get information at that p at time period. Um, so that just shows you a very good distribution across the state. So it wasn't just one truck stop where we recruited controls. It really, the purpose of controls in this study was to get a representative sample of truck drivers in these states. That's the, the instrument we, uh, these are the questions we asked about. Uh, I won't go into a lot of detail. We, we did have a quite a focus for the drivers around sleep uh, and we wanted to also get an understanding of sleep apnea which is a sleep pathology that um, the general population can have, a proportion of the general population have, um, which, which actually just contributes to very poor quality sleep and, and obviously that's a cumulative factor that you would end up if you have poor quality sleep over a long period of time, you have a lot of deficits in, in your performance of tasks. So we were very interested to know just how whether that was a significant problem for this industry. Um, to do that, uh, in previous research, they'd simply just asked the driver if you had it. Um, what we did in this study was actually use a diagnostic test, and that um, device uh, at the bottom there look, that looks like a mouse is this new diagnostic test for sleep apnea. And a driver was sent this in the mail once they were recruited into our study. They, uh, it has a, a nasal cannula, so two tubes that would go up your nose. They would put those up their nose and sleep with this device overnight. Um, and that would just sit on the bedside, the, the mouse. It would record their sleep um, and their breathing over that sleep period. Uh, they'd send that, put it in a little box, send it back to us, or go through the laboratory, and it, would, it, it was giving us an indication as to whether the driver had uh, sleep apnea or not. Uh, so in the past, to really have a reasonable diagnosis of that, you'd have to go into hospital and stay overnight and so on. Um, so, so some of the findings from the study, and, and these may not be very clear, these numbers uh, at the back of the room, so I'll just sort of highlight, I've, I've put some of them in, in red. 99% um, of our drivers were male, uh, and I think that's probably a changing demographic in this industry. Um, only last week I read in the, in the Age, I think it was, uh, you, know, you know, the numbers of women that are um, coming into the industry. Um, but for this study, um, it was 99%. Average age of drivers, uh, 44, 46 years, that sort of age. Um, 
And you can see here their average take home pay per week was, was uh, similar between those who had crashed and those who hadn't. Um, so it's useful to actually look at the control data because that, given it is a random sample of drivers, gives you an indication of you know, what you're likely to see across the industry. Um, majority of drivers uh, in terms of their employment status are uh, employed uh, with the company. They're not owner-operators. Uh, owner um, years of driving. Um, it was sort of mixed, uh, not, that ma not as many as we would have expected to have had a lot of experience in driving. Um, and that could be a reflection of us including Western Australia in the study, and I'll, I'll mention that in a moment. Um, and, and as you can see here, that the majority of ways that these drivers are being paid is a, um, a performance-based payment. Um, uh, I think it's 67% roughly are, are on that sort of um, payment structure. Um, average hours per week driving, 50 to 60 hours, um, quite a considerable range with some 130 hours um, in driving. Um, most vehicles are, are articulated um, and interestingly just we were looking at the sort of what was being carried. Uh, we had good distribution across the um, study of you know, dangerous goods, um, um, general freight, um, and, and obviously we were particularly interested also to look at whether, at the time of crash, for example, whether their load, what load they had on board, if it was empty, for example. Uh, an interesting finding, these are some of the findings around sleep apnea. Um, pr diagnosed um, via that little monitor device that I had um, described just earlier, uh, it shows that about 19% of those drivers who had crashed and about 16% uh, of controls actually were diagnosed with sleep apnea. Now the prevalence of sleep apnea in the general population is about 3%. So we have a, a work uh, occupational grouping that have very high rate of sleep apnea. And that's not, wouldn't be unexpected. Um, when we use a diagnosis, another uh, more of a subjective measure of, of sleep apnea, it, that can go up to about almost 50%. Um, so this is the um, multivariate apnea um, index and, and that's a combination of, of the driver's self-report, their body mass index, so their weight and height, um, and, and their sleep pattern. And that shows even higher levels of potential sleep apnea. So we've got a significant challenge within this workforce in relation to this pathology. Um, these are the key findings in relation to crash risk. So what we do is we model all this data and try and understand what are the key factors that are contributing to crashes. And, and this slide highlights that. Um, I don't, hopefully it's not too confusing. You've got lots of arrows going up to the sky and down to the ground. But basically what those arrows are trying to highlight is one's an increased risk, the white ones are increased risk, and the red arrows pointing to the ground are decreased risk. So um, the experience of the driver is a, a significant predictor of, of crash risk. So uh, in this instance, we've got this cut point of less than 10 years or greater than 10 years. And that, that's really an arbitrary cut point. It was really because of the numbers we had in the study. We had a, about 500 drivers in each of the groups. Uh, if, if we had a larger number, we'd be able to have you know, different levels of experience, years of experience. But what it was pointing to is that those drivers who were inexperienced had a, a threefold increased risk of crash. So uh, as you'd imagine, these are you know, very large rigs and, uh, and quite complex to handle. And, and there's obviously a lot of experience that's required that you take on board over the years in terms of handling them. Um, and I think this has driven this finding a little bit by some of the findings we were getting out of the Western Australian um, element of the study, which we were finding talking to the industry that they were losing experienced drivers to the mining industry. Um, and as a result, they were recruiting into the driving uh, much younger and more inexperienced drivers. Um, and, and so we were seeing that. Um, types of load carried. Uh, I actually thought you know, having maybe dangerous goods might have been a greater risk of crash. Uh, but in fact, it's not at all. In fact, having an empty load was the greatest risk of, of crashing. Um, and again, talking to industry, there are a number of reasons that could be occurring there. Uh, it could be that um, the, the rig really does handle very differently when it's empty and the braking system does, um, and a good understanding around that is really needed. Um, but we also know that 
there is, you know, the, the, often their load is empty at the end of, of their shift, end of their trip, um, when also there, there are levels of fatigue uh, involved um, and need to, to get back either to pick up a new load uh, and some of those pressures that may be on drivers. So, again, that may be also a contributing factor to seeing, you know, a twofold or almost threefold increased risk of a crash with an empty, an empty load. Um, truck, uh, two technology pieces within uh, on the truck, cruise control and anti-lock braking systems were found to be um, very beneficial um, to reducing crash risk. In this instance, I'm saying if you don't have them on your, on your rig, uh, it increases your crash risk. Um, and that could be an indicator reflecting just the age of the fleet that we have, um, with fewer of the vehicles having those sort of technologies on board. Um, and, and so I think that's a, a really important measure to be coming out of this study, that there are opportunities within the rig to ensure that there is uh, the technology to enhance safety. Uh, elements around, I mean, and this is, this is always a, a, an interesting area in this industry, which is around fatigue management, um, but time since last break. It was showing if you don't have a break within a four-hour four driving period, increased your, it increased your risk. Uh, I think in this instance almost it was 2.4 times. So if you hadn't taken a break within a four-hour period, it increased your risk, you know, twofold or more. Um, so that is a really important message around, you know, this, the scheduling that drivers are operating with. It, it is important to ensure that there is sufficient brakes. Um, and, uh, and clearly in the absence of that, within a four-hour period, will increase crash risk. Um, crash time, midnight to 6 a.m., that is a significant issue. 3.4 times crash risk is, the crash risk is increased for that. Um, we, we know that uh, in this study about those drivers who had crashed, about 20% of them had done uh, more than half of their trip uh, at night and, and between midnight and 6 a.m. Now, that's an incredibly, I mean, I can see there's a whole bunch of reasons why uh, schedules may be operating for drivers to work through the night. But it's important to understand also that physiologically that's an incredibly challenging time for drivers. Um, they're going to be battling the circadian rhythm. Um, they're coming off, uh, based on this studies from this study, they've got poor quality sleep, uh, either through having a pathology like sleep apnea. So there's a cumulative effect with sleep apnea around uh, the quality of sleep you're getting and you're bringing that, de that deprived or, or cumulative sleep deprivation into a task and then placing it, uh, that much of that task at a period of the day when physiologically we, we don't operate well. So we know that if you're operating at least, say, three hours at night, that can have a performance detriment of about equivalent to driving with a 0.08 um, blood alcohol level. So, so that's a significant challenge, I think, for operators, to know that operating your schedules through that period of the night is a challenge uh, for the driver. And, um, and it will increase crash risk. Now, we're talking about crash risk. When I talk about crash risk, risk, I'm talking about a probability. So it's not saying your driver will go out there tonight and drive at that time and will crash, but it will increase the probability of them crashing over time. Um, so, so that is, a, a, you know, I think a, a really important point that, that we've identified in this study. And, and probably this is m some of the most objective data you're going to get in these sorts of areas around crash risk. Um, use of caffeinated drinks um, reduces crash risk. Um, so it reduces it by about, uh, about 70%. So that's a really, uh, really important point. I guess um, when we talk about caffeinated drinks here, we're talking about not only coffee. Uh, drivers are taking coffee, they're taking, uh, they're drinking Coke, they're taking Nodos, caffeine tablets. So there's a whole array of caffeine or stimulant types, uh, that, stimulants that are being taken. Um, the, the challenge with those sorts of <clears throat> uh, approaches to in maintaining alertness is that they are short-lived. Uh, and there is nothing you can do to, to counteract the sleep pathologies and the poor quality sleep the drivers are bringing into the driving task and then also the challenges around the schedulings and particularly at night, for example. So, you know, those are the sort of things. This is not unique to the, the trucking industry. This is particularly shift work type um, occupations. There is a major challenge um, dealing with that. 
particularly on the transport system. Um, and it did show, we, you know, we, we were finding that those drivers who had had a number of days off and then were coming into their driving task um, with reasonable levels of sleep were at much reduced risk of crashing than those who'd been, you know, driving on a three or four day shift and then um, being interviewed. So, so clearly, you know, the level and the quality of sleep is a challenge in this industry um, and, and that's, uh, you know, I don't have answers for that. I, I'm certainly no uh, sleep physician, um, but there may be some opportunities around how do we improve this element for the industry. And, and at the moment within Monash there is a large group um, and it's called the Cooperative Research Centre for Alertness that are really working on this type of question. So uh, just to also let you know that you know there is work going on to sort of focus around some of these key issues. Um, so just to conclude then just some of the discussion um, employer company factors that I've really sort of alluded to all of these now really the, the time since last break is is important um, and it's important to sort of message to drivers to ensure that they try and take um, a break within the four-hour time period um, you know you, you many of your drivers will be operating under sort of basic fatigue uh, management regulations or, or advanced fatigue management regulations and so you know they're complex uh, and and there's a lot of regulation around that now, um, but I guess the the importance there is is the regular break um, as much as you can, and and that you know talking to Nolene for example is important. I mean it, it's easy to say you know take a regular break, but you've got to ensure the infrastructure supports a regular break so that you can actually park a rig, um, you know a B dub, you know so that it can be safely secured off the road network and not on the side of the road, which could cause you know, greater hazard to other road users. Um, I highlighted that risk is greatest between that midnight and 6 a.m. I, look, I, this is, when I presented these sort of findings in, in Western Australia, it did have a, a, a quite a useful insight for them because um, their mining industry, for example, always operated their dangerous goods travel uh, at that between midnight and 6 a.m. And for good reasons. I mean, clearly, you know, exposure in relation to other vehicles on the road is minimal at that time. But they hadn't counted the fact that the person in charge of that rig is, is, is their performance detriment is going to be considerably worse than if they were operating it during the middle of the day. Um, and on that basis alone, they actually they took these results and had a good discussion around around this. I don't know whether they have actually now changed their policy around moving dangerous goods in those hours or not, but at least it has highlighted that there is a challenge in doing that. Payment rates. Um, we in this study, um, I, I know this is a sensitive area. We were very interested in looking at payment rates. Um, and in the type of study design that we had, we weren't able to show relationships between payment rates, but since then we've been doing quite a lot of work in this area, uh, and I'm certainly happy to talk to anyone about uh, what we're finding in relation to payment rates and, and associated risk. Um, driver factors, so the experience of the driver is an important fact and, and it's useful to know that there is a truck safe program operating with ATA uh, and I think this should be a key element around that, that it is, you know, it's a, you know, a task that does require uh, experience um, and how we can impart that or how you can impart that is really key, um, particularly with, uh, you know, you have uh, the median age is 46 for um, drivers. It's not a young uh, occupation. Uh, it would be a really important measure to, for ATA to take on board to work out how they can ensure they can train and provide a level of, of safety for younger drivers who are entering the, the profession. Um, hours of sleep, 24 hours before trip, crucial, and use of caffeinated drinks. Um, we, we published that finding and one of my PhD students presented, I think, to this meeting a few years ago, um, which showed this relationship. Uh, and I think, look, it is an important, it's, a, it's an important finding that caffeine is, a, we know, is a stimulant and it is important. Uh, and, and those uh, sort of health promotion campaigns where people are providing coffee on the side of the road, Clearly that has a, has a benefit, but it's a very short-term benefit, and I think that's the measure. You can only uh, get you know, a, a benefit soon after the consumption. Um, 
loads carried, cruise control, anti-lock braking systems. I guess just a lot of the work I'm now doing is on intelligent transport systems and I'm very keen for Australia to start, take a much stronger leadership role in this area. Um, and intelligent transport systems uh, are going to have enormous benefit in this industry. Um, with lane departure warning systems, so there's, there's a whole array of in-vehicle technologies. But I'm talking also about connected vehicles, so where trucks talk to the infrastructure and also talk to other vehicles. Uh, and uh, I'm hoping to get a, a sort of a trial up and running in, in the area around Geelong to look at these sorts of initiatives. So um, technology is going to play a huge part over the next 10, uh, 15 years in this industry and uh, to enormous value around safety. Thank you. Thank you.